This is Kick-Ass Politics. I'm Ben Mathis. Hey, folks, just a quick announcement. We're in the midst of a very important fundraising drive to come up with all of our production costs for 2016. If you like Kick-Ass Politics and you value what I'm doing here, then I hope you'll go to GoFundMe.com backslash kickass politics and donate what you can. It's vital that we fund our production budget for the coming year so I can focus my energies on the content side of kickass politics and keep producing new episodes for you every week. So be a part of what I'm creating here. Just go to GoFundMe.com backslash kickass politics or hit the donate button on our webpage at kickasspolitics.com. Thanks in advance, folks, and now enjoy the show. Hi there, I'm Ben Mathis, and welcome to Kick-Ass Politics. Folks, if you've been listening for very long, you can probably guess that I'm not a big reality TV fan. But over the past three or four weeks, I've gotten sucked in by a brand new documentary reality series that's airing on Sunday nights on Showtime. It's called The Circus, Inside the Greatest Political Show on Earth. The pitch for The Circus is that it pulls back the curtain on the 2016 presidential race, revealing the intense, inspiring, and infuriating stories behind the headlines. Now, obviously, I enjoy this show because, well, I'm a political junkie. But even if you're not an addict like me, it's fun and entertaining enough that I think you just might get hooked, because it follows this year's presidential candidates on the trail in a much more intimate and personal way than you're used to seeing them. And it also gives you a look at the manic pace and unpredictability of a presidential primary through the eyes of the campaign operatives and traveling reporters who sometimes struggle to keep up with their candidates. It's co-hosted by three political rock stars, Mark Halperin, John Heilman, and Mark McKinnon. Halperin and Heilman are journalists who collectively have nearly 60 years covering presidential politics. They're the co-authors of the best-selling books Game Change and Double Down, and now they're co-managing editors at Bloomberg Politics and co-hosts of Bloomberg TV's With All Due Respect. The third element, Mark McKinnon, brings an entirely different perspective to the circus, that of a seasoned media advisor to the campaigns of President George W. Bush in 2000 and 2004 and Senator John McCain in 2008. An award-winning producer and communications strategist, Mark McKinnon has also served as the consultant to the television series The Newsroom and House of Cards, and he writes a weekly column for The Daily Beast, Today he's joining me to talk about what it's like to go from being the ultimate presidential campaign insider to following the campaigns as a member of the media. We'll talk about the breakneck production pace of the circus and his thoughts and predictions for 2016. Coming up with political legend Mark McKinnon. to Washington, it's time for Kick-Ass Politics. And now here's your host, Ben Mathis. Today I'm joined over the phone by Mark McKinnon, who has been a campaign media strategist for 30 years to a number of presidential campaigns. And he now stars alongside journalists Mark Halperin and John Heilman in the Showtime documentary series called The Circus, Inside the Greatest Political Show on Earth. Mark, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, thanks. Glad to join you, Ben. Um, We're taping this the day before the New Hampshire primary. Are you somewhere in the Granite State right now? I I just left because I've been gone for two weeks in Iowa and New Hampshire, and I left to edit last night's show in New York. And I'm currently in Austin, Texas, just to get some clean laundry and head back to New Hampshire tomorrow. (laughs) That's interesting. So you're involved in the editing process in the show? I know that you're a producer and you're one of the leads on it. Well, what we do is we have an amazing production team called Left Right uh, Productions out of New York, and uh, 
they they I mean they're the production end of this this deal and they're superstars and they do all the magic. We just have determined that it's important that one of us, me, Mark, and John, at least one of us, be there for the final edit because they're just there. It's not so much technical production issues as it is just kind of political eyes on some of the things that you know just like title cards and things that. And we're crashing the show so fast. We're literally doing it, you know, just in hours. So it's not like we can easily have phone calls over the road for this last minute stuff. So one of us always has to, we've decided, should be in New York for the very final edit. Well, yeah, and you're the guy who's produced probably hundreds of political commercials over the years. So I would think that you would be uh, probably the best of the three of you to be in the editing room. I, I don't know about that, but you know the funny thing about this show is that it, it really is a an, an extension of of something that we did in the 2000 Bush campaign, where we produced something called Crash Ads, as it came to be known, which which was simply we you know we'd do an event or something and we'd shoot it and we'd edit it right there immediately and put it on the air that night, uh, and the idea of, of doing that was that that there was, you know, absolute immediacy to putting it up that quickly. And it drove, really, it was a free press strategy. It wasn't so much that people were seeing it on paid media, but the press would report on that. So, but when we did that, I always, from the very first time we did it, I just thought, man, if you could do this in a more extended documentary way and, and reveal to viewers just how interesting a presidential campaign is, A, but B, to do it in real time would be, so cool and now what we're getting a chance to do that uh, yeah how did the project come about what was that something that the three of you approached showtime with or they no, approached you uh, actually it, it, it actually i started thinking about it and started pitching it 14 years ago um wow. and and back in 2002 i had the initial thought and at that time i was actually uh it was called knockdown in the swamp that was the original <laughs> title and i was going to do it in louisiana but the same same concept. It was like we were going to try and get behind the campaigns and roll it up in real time. And I just uh, and Louisiana just because that was an off year election at the time, and uh, and just because Louisiana politics are so colorful. So we got a lot of interest, and but our timing, you know, didn't work out, et cetera. And it kind of put it to bed for a while. And then a couple of years ago, the idea kind of popped back up, and the idea of doing it with a presidential made it even more interesting, of course. Um, and then we, we had a lot of conversations with a lot of people and I could write a whole book about all of that because it's just so interesting. Um, uh, but we talked to, you know, major network players and the, the thing about the show is that it was never complicated for people to get the idea. I mean, it was, the pitch was easy. People, and then the executive would say, Oh man, yeah, got it. Cool. That'd be really, that'd be great. But then the next question was always, how in the hell are you going to do this? And the prospect of shooting something Monday through Friday or Saturday and editing it, you know, in a crash way like that. So network executives usually see a show, you know, weeks if not months ahead of time, yeah. see a finished show and have time to kind of deliberate and think about it. In this case, they have hours. I mean, you know, the Showtime executives are seeing this show like, you know, Sunday before Sunday night. So... <laughs> There's really limited time for them to say, oh, you know, do this or do that. You know, they're, they're, it's a real – so I give great kudos to David Evans and Showtime for not only getting it, but, but for having the big cojones to say, you know, we're going to do this and, and we're realizing just what an incredible challenge it is and risk, really, for them to, to, to put on a show that they see just hours before it goes on. Yeah, it really is ambitious because, you know, there have been political documentaries before. They're like – like Met, The War Room, yep. Uh, yep. Journeys with George. But yep. those usually don't even come out till three, six months after the election's over. This well, is, as far as of, I know, the first those, time anyone's done anything. All three of those that you like just this. mentioned are, have been inspirations for this project um, really? in, in their own way. They're all really good. But the Met one particularly was interesting because that was one where, you know, A, it was a really good documentary. B, um, it, it, there's a lot of kind of, uh, looking back, because the campaign and Mitt Romney said you can do this, but you, but they did it with the caveat that you cannot show it till after the election. Well, they have a huge regret about that decision now. They all wished, including Mitt Romney, I hear, 
that that uh, that that had shown before the election, and understandably, because you see it, and you go, man, where was that guy during the election? And then, and if you know, if people had, had a chance to see that side of Mitt Romney, I don't know that it would have changed the outcome, but but it certainly, you know, it it it, it showed a side of him that the audience uh, didn't see and voters didn't see, and it, and I and it certainly would have had an impact. So seeing that, you know, I thought, well, gee, you know, we'll do something and we'll give these candidates an opportunity to sh- to show a more documentary human side of what they're like and what this effort's like and the impact on family and staff and 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 do it real time. And the, the key to me, too, was and the other challenge was, when I say real time, I mean as real time as possible, which is weekly. Now, some of the people we talked to said, how about monthly or how about, you know, we'll do six of them over the course of the year or something like that. And I just... I really held firm to that to that notion because I just think that the appeal uh, for this show is, is not only that political junkies like it, and they do, but I wanted it to have a, 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 an, a, a relevance to people who I describe as um, uh, not junkies, but people who are politically interested, casually interested in politics. In other words, they're good citizens and they vote pretty regularly, but especially in presidential elections. But they don't read the playbook. They don't watch the Sunday show. They don't read the New York Times or Washington Post. But they do want to get. They do want to be informed, and they just want to get an, their information in an interesting way. And that's what we're doing. We're providing a way for them on Sunday nights, which, by the way, was another great thing that Showtime gave us that great real estate. Yeah. So that people can see it Sunday night and then go to work on Monday and go, oh yeah, Rubio did this or Bernie did that, and they can they can be informed without having to kind of slog through all the terrible stuff. So that was really the key to me. To uh, w- That was a big rationale behind doing it weekly was that people – and by the way, I'll say about that, that even shooting weekly, when we're shooting stuff on Thursday and Friday, sometimes the shit stuff we shot Monday and Tuesday feels really old. Yeah, and especially in this kind of 24-hour news cycle, it's hard because you have this show that is kind of a hybrid of that because – you do have the immediacy of wanting to get that out as soon as possible, but it's also, it's a documentary, and I feel almost that it's, and I don't mean this in a disparaging way, I mean this actually in a good way, that it's more a reality show than a traditional political documentary, because it's actually really interesting and entertaining, and the and the interesting emotional side, and the exhaustion of the candidates and everyone around them, and it really kind of cuts through a lot of the BS and gives you a real window into what these campaigns are really like. You know, the, the last episode that I watched just last night, it, it aired on a Sunday night, and you had scenes from Saturday's Republican debate and Bernie Sanders' appearance on SNL the previous night. I mean, <laughs> how are you keeping this pace, and how do you achieve that kind of turnaround? Well, just, just to give you a, a, a glimpse of, of how intense it is, we— in the middle of the night, Saturday night, we had somebody just quit. They just said, I can't handle it anymore. Oh, really? <laughs> I hope and it wasn't someone too that, important. They were the person who was supposed to get us the, the debate footage to, to New York. Uh, <laughs> and then they, they just sort of fell over and said, I can't, I, that's it. That's all I got. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a, I mean, it's a crushing pace. I mean, some of these camera guys are working 90 plus hours and like five or six days and getting two hours of sleep a night. So we're, we're we're already realizing we kind of have to rotate in fresh crew. And, <laughs> but again, the mediacy is what's really key. And, uh, and so that's important for us to, to try and, and we, we want to try and sustain that as best we can. Um, uh, because I do think that providing that immediacy makes a difference. Um, the, the, you also made the point about, uh, people seeing the different sides of candidates. The, the most rewarding thing to me about this and my greatest ambition for the show uh, is happening, which is that the people who are watching it, who weren't, as I said, who aren't political junkies, uh, watch it and they feel better about politics. Which, which, um, you know, that, again, that's sort of my greatest ambition of the show is that people would see what these candidates have to go through, how hard it is, the pressure, and that they would see that and say, "Wow, you know, this is actually pretty amazing what they have to do, what, you know, what their families go through, uh, you know, the exhaustion factor and." You know, the reality is that after you watch this, you go, God, these are, it's amazing what they're going through. You kind of, it, 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 you get a sense of that it's a really noble pursuit and you, your respect is enhanced for what they have to go through. So that's, that's the, the really, uh, the best thing about the show and in, in the sort of macro picture is that, uh, that people are watching it. 
and they're accept- and, you know they're they're where you're just getting great feedback about it, great buzz on it. But ultimately, the best thing is that people watch it and say, "Man, I actually, you know, was, despite all the things we hear about how horrible politics is, we watch this and we actually feel better about it." You've been on the inside of a couple presidential campaigns, the the two Bush campaigns for president, and also McCain's 2008 run. What's more exhausting, being a strategist on the inside or being a, a journalist or a documentarian covering the campaigns from the outside? I didn't think it could get any harder than doing the campaigns. Uh, I describe them as human microwaves. <laughs> but, but, the, but, but producing this show is like an election every Sunday. And it's, it's, it's as hard as anything I've ever done. But again, it's exciting and thrilling. So that, that kind of gives me the adrenaline to keep going. But uh, um, it, it, it's just fun for me to be able to just do so. I couldn't do another campaign, not if you put a gun to my head. But this is different. And it's, and I feel like we're revealing something that's interesting and entertaining and informative. So well, well worth the, uh, well worth the blood, sweat, and tears for sure. Yeah, and the 2008 uh, McCain campaign was your last official presidential campaign. Uh, what was it that made you decide enough was enough? Well, you don't. I mean, you don't see a lot a lot of old people doing campaigns, <laughs> uh, and there's a reason. Uh, you know, it's just it, it crushes you. Win, lose, or draw. I mean, the the campaigns I've uh, been lucky enough to be part of and won were you know, just as crushing as losing. Uh, it just takes a psychological and physical toll on you. After those campaigns, I've had to go, you know, I mean, I, I you know, it just, even when we won, it's, I, I describe it as you, you sort of turn on these adrenaline valves in your body and your brain that aren't normally, you know, turned on like fire hoses. <laughs> and they're on nonstop for, you know, up to two years. And it just screws up your head and your body. I mean, it just really does. It just kind of creates this biological imbalance in your system <laughs> so that, you know, it just kind of makes you live in dog years. And so uh, after I did, I hadn't even intended on doing the McCain race. The only reason I did that was just I really liked McCain and kind of just felt that he had sacrificed a lot for his country. And, you know, this was, I, I, I had told him, listen, if I can, go mow your lawn or something in Sedona sometime, let me do it. And he said, well, why don't you come help me do this? And so I did, but uh, it wasn't because I wanted to do another one. Does a person have to be completely insane to run for president? Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) You know, uh, I mean, that's, it, it is, it's such an extraordinary thing these people go through. So it's a combination of, yeah, they're just not like us. I mean, they've got another chromosome. And I think some of them are good and some of them are, you know, maybe, you know, I think it's some of it is a drive for public service and probably some of it's a drive for attention and ego and all of that. But it, but the whole combination requires a really different kind of cat to run. And, you know, I could certainly never do it. I'm always amazed when I'm around any of these people that anybody can do it or is willing to put themselves through it. But, but again, when you see what they go through, it really raises your respect and admiration for, for what they're willing to go through to get there. And also, you realize that, that it's as tough and difficult and messy as the process is, it actually makes them ultimately better candidates and I think, in the end, better office holders when they get there. Yeah, and you know, looking at this particular election, we might have a few candidates this time around who actually meet the clinical definition of insanity. Um, <laughs> after Iowa and looking at the polls going into New Hampshire, is there a real possibility that this election may come down to our craziest versus their craziest? And it, it sure could. It sure could. And that's why you've got people like Michael Bloomberg thinking about an independent run. You know, they see the way this thing's playing out, and they're thinking, well, maybe there's, maybe there's an opportunity here for somebody to go throw up an independent candidacy. Uh, and I, I think that that's, you know, uh, I don't know if it's a real possibility, but it's a possibility. Well, you know, he's floated that before. How serious do you, do you think that he is this time? And in full disclosure, your show is actually produced yeah. uh, by Bloomberg, Bloomberg Politics. Bloomberg is our partner, so. but, but I, I'll be yeah. fairly candid about it. I'll be completely candid about it, which is to say that my take on Michael Bloomberg and running is that he, that he'd love to run, but he'll only run if he really thinks he can win. And I think mm. I think he's thought about it a lot before, 
And I think he's kind of done looked at him very closely and gets up the line. But but in the at the end, he's a very pragmatic guy, and he doesn't want to just go be Don Quixote. But but if he looks at it and he's you know, he's got very smart people around him, they look at it, and they can kind of game plan the thing out and say, well, you know, there's actually a shot to go do this and win this thing, then they'll they'll take a hard look at it. Hmm. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and then I'll be back to talk more with Mark McKinnon, co-star of Showtime's The Circus. Folks, do you like to read, but you don't have the time? Give audiobooks a try. All those times you spend listening to this podcast, you can also be listening to a great book. You can play it on your drive to work, on a run, in the bathtub, while cooking, or just sitting and enjoying one of those rare stolen moments. And right now, you can download any audiobook you want for free with a special promotion for our listeners from audible.com. Just go to audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics for a free 30-day trial and a free download of any of Audible's 180,000 titles for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, iPad, or MP3 player. That's audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics. Or click on the sponsor link on our webpage to download the free audiobook of your choice. And now, back to the show. We're back, and I'm talking to Mark McKinnon, political media strategist and star of Showtime's The Circus. Mark, let me ask you this. There's one thing that I still can't seem to wrap my head around. In 2012, Republicans, you had uh, Mitt Romney, who got portrayed as being heartless, one percenter, who was out of touch with the common man, even though in reality, you know, as you saw in the documentary Mitt, he's very humble, kind, unpretentious guy. Suddenly, this time around, four years later, you have Trump, who lives in a penthouse made of gold, flies around on a jet with his name on it, with his supermodel on his arm, (laughs) brags about his wealth, and somehow he's considered to be a populist and a man of the people. What's going on here? Well, a part of it uh, is, and maybe a big part of it, is that that Trump has FU money. You know, I mean, he, I think he's done a very smart thing from a message point of view, not taking donor money. Because basically what he's saying is, I, you know, I am going to be so independent, or I am so independent, that if I'm elected, I'll be beholden to nobody. And, and, and the proof is in the pudding, which is I'm not taking any money from anybody, no lobbyists, no, you know, and, um, and Romney couldn't say that. I mean, even though he had a lot of money, he had a lot of big donors and lobbyists around that campaign so that, you know, people, I think, drew a conclusion, right or wrong, that he was, you know, well connected to all those interests. And Trump can just say, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a guy that hadn't been in that world, I'm not part of that world, and I'm not taking their money. And I think that's, that's part of the driving rationale for a big part of his support. Yeah, and it's interesting because you actually uh, co-founded an organization that was tasked with uh, combating big money in politics. So is there something about that message from Trump that resonates with you? Oh, no question. I, I, I mean, it's a, I love that message, and I'd love to see more of it from candidates. I, I, uh, it's one of my initial attractions to John McCain, that he was one of the leading advocates and fighters against big money in politics. And it, you know, it, it continues to be a concern and a passion of mine. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, I think it's a, I think it is a much deeper problem than it is than is acknowledged, um, uh, and so I, I continue to, uh, you know, the, the circus is my complete 24/7 job these days. But I, I've set up and I'm on, on the boards of a number of organizations that are dedicated to reforming big money in politics, and 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 uh, and I I agree. I think that. I agree with that component of the Trump message, and I think that's part of what people are responding to. And it's, I think it's uh, a a problem. It's b it's something we need to, to do something about. It's it's hard to it's a it's a there's a lot of frustration in the money reform community because it's just it's a hard thing to talk about. People just sort of they sort of acknowledge it, but they just they don't believe you can do anything about it. That's the problem. And so so somebody stepping up and saying, yeah, I'm going to run this on my own and not take money. By the way, that, that was something. The real disappointment with Barack Obama, you know, he mm-hmm. had initially said he wasn't going to take 
you know, he was going to uh, apply for the general fund money in that uh, first 2008 race and then did a complete 180 on it, which, you know, uh, was very disappointing to me and a lot of others in the reform community on money. So, but it just testifies to how important it is to candidates. And, you know, like I said, it's, that's the area of my work where I specialize in steep hills and big rocks. <laughs> well, as someone who's been in the business for 30 years, you know that there are certain time-tested rules in this game that have served candidates very well for a long time. Is the Trump phenomenon, if we're still calling it that, a one-time exception to the rule book, or do you think that this candidacy may change the rule book itself for campaigns long after 2016? I think we're going to be thinking and writing about Donald Trump. You know, win, lose, or draw, we're going to be writing about this guy and deconstructing his campaign for years to come. I mean, as it'll be in the history books, uh, just the extent to which he defied the conventional wisdom and rewrote the rule book. So, you know, probably 75% of that is Donald Trump, and you know, 25% of it is just him kind of figuring out it's a new media age that we live in, and uh, so I think some of that will become structural and ongoing, and people are going to discover that, you know, he found new ways to kind of dominate the cycle. Now, uh, like I said, a good part of that is just that it's who he is, but he also figured out a way to kind of manage and manipulate the system in a way to his advantage, and people are going to learn take some lessons from that. Yeah, and let's talk about the other side. Um, the Iowa caucuses handed Hillary a narrow victory that's been perceived, at least, as a huge loss. And if she loses in New Hampshire, as the polls seem to indicate, is she headed for a repeat of 2008? I don't know about that. I, I It's certainly, uh, it, it may be not be probable, but it's possible. And the one thing that I think it does do, I mean, Bernie Sanders has come so much further and farther than anybody thought, kind of like Donald Trump, which just testifies to the kind of environment that we're in. I do think that it means that 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 Bernie Sanders is you know is now a legitimate candidate uh, that people take seriously, and he is very well funded, particularly from small donors, um, and that he can go the distance. and And I think that he's likely he's going to at this point. I mean, I, you know, why even if he loses uh, some contests, uh, and even if it looks like you know, Hillary's going to go on the nomination. I mean, he, he can really leverage the situation by accumulating delegates, going to the convention, asking for some concessions. Uh, so, uh, you know, he, he he's going to have a big impact on this race. And, 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 you know, just, you know, as putting on my Republican strategist hat, this is all good for the Republicans and to the extent that it's not just a coronation. And, yeah. You know, it means that Hillary Clinton, even if she does go on and win the nomination, has to spend a lot more time and resources getting there. So, you know, the great thing about all this is that it just makes the whole race that much more interesting. And, you know, not only for the public, but for us to make a television show about. In doing a TV show like this, you know, often the goals of a documentarian and the goals of a political candidate are at odds, as you kind of referenced earlier, particularly with the fact that Mitt didn't want to release the documentary Mitt until after the election. How do you work around that disconnect between the goals of a documentary filmmaker and a political candidate's campaign? Well, it's uh, it's organic and dynamic. And, you know, we have experienced, uh, you know, all levels of access from complete to none at all. And but we knew from the very beginning that it would be uh, an evolutionary process. We'd get what we could, and hopefully people would see the show and think that it's, you know, that it's well done. That we're not going in with a, you know, point of view. All we want to do is reflect as best as we, as any documentary and documentarian should, what's happening. Just an honest reflection. We're just trying to put a mirror up, but but also bring mirrors where they've never been before. But it's not to distort the image. It's just to show what's going on. So. Um, the, the good news is that you know any of the candidates and campaigns that have seen the show really like it, and they they get that it's you know that it's more access is is good for us, but it's good for them too. So, but uh, again, you know, I, I've always felt that access was was helpful and interesting, but that's not what it's all about. I, I think there's a, there's a big part of the circus that's well beyond sort of being in the inner sanctum of you know with a candidate. There are there are players and characters in this circus that 
uh, you know, are nowhere near the candidates. There's just those 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 field people, those advanced people, those, those uh, uh, family, you know, the press corps itself. You mentioned Journeys with George. One of the amazing things about that documentary is it became, you know, as much about the press as it was about the campaign. <laughs> and the whole press dynamic was fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting because the other two principles of the show are lifelong journalists. This is yeah. your first time doing something like this. You've always been inside the bubble of the campaign. Right. And now here you are traveling on the campaign plane and in the campaign buses with the journalists. How are you getting along with them? Because they, weren't they usually the enemy <laughs> for you before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the great thing about the show is that we we do have Mark and John who are, you know, blue chip journalists who you know, wrote Game Change. And so they, they bring that that credibility and equity to the table of, as just longtime working journalists who've covered it from the outside. Uh, and I bring a perspective of somebody who's been in the campaigns from the inside. So I just, you know, I just bring a perspective that is somebody who understands and is sympathetic or critical sometimes of what's happening inside the, the camp, uh, the, the, the campaigns and the dynamic of the staff and, uh, and knowing what they're going through. So I, that I, I think it's a nice balanced perspective of having the working journalist plus the campaign guy uh, who's who's kind of seen it from the inside. So we just that just helps bring a more 360 perspective to the whole thing. How far are you guys going to take this? Is this going to go through the general election? Uh, you know, it's really an outstanding issue just because uh, it's 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 it has been an ongoing discussion about, I mean, we had one time said, well, let's just go through the conventions and, and Showtime said, well, let's go, through, let's, let's go ahead and go through the election, through the election. Um, so it's, it's not entirely resolved. I think, you know, if all things were perfect, I think we'd love to go through the election if we can. I'd also say that, you know, that this has been, uh, you know, just having done four episodes, it's it's a phenomenal pace and workload for everybody, which is fine. But I also think we're probably we're, that we're probably blowing through the budget faster than we anticipated. <laughs> okay. So I don't know what that'll mean. And, and the other thing is, we're, we I'm, and we're not going straight through no matter what. We're going to have some dark periods. Right. You know, after the primaries, after the convention. So we're, we're going to figure out where to dial that up and down. It'll be somewhat budget driven and, but also kind of narrative driven and just seeing what's going to be interesting and where we can go to keep telling the story. If this thing is a big hit, I don't know what Showtime's going to do next year when the election's over and they want to renew for another season. So, but well, uh, I, I can't, I can't be specific about that, but uh, you know, the one thing is that we all realize, including, David Nevins, that we've got something really special here, and and uh, you know he's already said you know if this if this really works with like it appears to be doing, we got to let's figure out how to a way to carry this on beyond this. And I, I don't know where or when or how that would be, but you, you uh, might end we, up we, covering we never, we never the think, Ugandan parliamentary elections. <laughs> no, exactly. That's what he's saying. Let's go to Europe. You know, let's, yeah. let's you know go to Africa. You know, wherever. I think I think the one thing that's well, I don't know what will happen if anything after all this, but uh, but I do think that we've proven the concept works. Yeah, and it works really well. Yeah, it it is extremely entertaining. Um, I'm curious because I've been in the business a little bit, and I've done campaign ads and worked on campaigns. And the biggest problem with going into politics that I have found is that, or the saddest part of it, is that the moment that you go into politics, you instantly alienate yourself from 50 percent of the population at a cocktail party or in any setting. What is yeah. your secret? Do you have a secret to being able to be political and still keep your friends? Uh, that's always tough, you know. And uh, for example, well, I'll just give you a, a for example. I, I've decided that, or I decided fairly, you know, within the last few years, sometime, I just quit putting anything political on Facebook. <laughs> well, you that's know, smart for I, anyone. I, I mean, <laughs> at least in terms of like expressing an opinion. It's just, you know, it just blows up and, and, and everybody goes crazy. And so, you know, I, I obviously have political opinions and, and express those pretty – and I have to express them pretty clearly in not only the work that I've done but a lot of the writing that I've done for the Daily Beast. Um, but the other thing is that, you know, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, 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 I'm not an ideologue. I never have been. I've always kind of been just either left of center or just right of center. So, 
So, you know, and most of my friends and neighbors kind of fall in that general sphere anyway. So it, 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 it's not a big issue with most of my friends or family, not a big problem. But, but, it, but it is a partisan time that we live in, and I get that. And as I said, what, what, what I'm trying to do in my work is, is not to create more division, but just find ways to, to just recognize that we have people that are increasingly polarized in their views and just find a way to bring them together so that we can – can can solve the problems that we have out there, even though we have a divided country. You know, the other night, Frank Luntz put out a question that's always been on my mind. Do you like it when a candidate says, when I'm president or if I'm president? Oh, you know, I, 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 I yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I never thought about that one. I would say... Ah, uh, I you know listen. I, I a big part of running is confidence, and I think if somebody's running and they you know they intend to, they think that they're they got what it takes to be president. They should say you know when I'm president, here's what I'm going to do. It doesn't you know, seem it, too it, presumptuous. Uh, You're the I message don't think guy. So. I, mean, really, I mean, just just because having worked in a lot of campaigns, I know that it's important for voters that what they want is a sense of confidence and strength. So you know, I don't think that's I don't think that's a real negative. I think that people just say, you know, if you're running for president, you 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 should you you, you you've got the sense that you uh, ought to be there, and just say that that's what your intention is going to be. <laughs> well, before we go, I want to ask you about the Mark McKinnon style. The D.C. political <laughs> class isn't exactly known for fashion, but you're not the typical blazer and tie political operative. You're usually seen with a cowboy hat and a Panuelo scarf. Where did the Mark <laughs> McKinnon style come from? Wow, I'm very impressed that you got the Panuelo. That's that's uh, that's some that's some either good cultural knowledge or some good research. <laughs> uh, um, well, I mean, just a couple of things. One is I don't really originally come from the world of politics or or corporate sort of work. I'm I'm a former songwriter. I ran away from home in the middle of high school and hitchhiked to Nashville and banged around the music business for a, for a decade or so. So that's kind of originally where I come from. And I've, I've just always hated to, to, I've never been much of a conformer. And uh, whenever I go to meetings and things, I don't like to be everybody else. I like to be the other guy. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and I always, and I had a very, well, two things. One is, uh, there's not a picture of me growing up. I don't have a hat on. I've always been the cat in the hat. I just love hats, and uh, uh, so that's that's not like an adopted style. It's just something I've done all my life. And then the scarf thing is, I just hated ties. You know, I just it, it's always seemed to me a really weird convention. That's you know, I don't know, a hundred years ago or whenever it was, somebody put a piece of cloth around their neck, and then everybody said everybody should do that every day. It just seemed weird, you know. It's like, why did, why did, how did we hang on to this weird convention that makes everybody look exactly the same? So I just throwing a scarf on was kind of a, at least a, 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 a nod of the, or a, 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 you know, at least a step in the direction of saying, okay, I need to put something on to look a little nicer, <laughs> but I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna put a noose around my neck. Well, yeah, and the good thing about it is, you know, usually the media guy on the campaign is the one that they give a little leeway to. Yeah, He's allowed I, I to be a little, a little, a little funky that, or creative. Now that I've done it, if I if I go anywhere and I don't have the hat or the scarf on, it's like, hey, where's the hat? Where's the scarf? So I have to wear it now. Oh, you're stuck with it now. That's right. Well, Mark McKinnon, thanks so much. The show is called The Circus, Inside the Greatest Political Show on Earth. You star with Mark Halpern and John Heilman, and it airs on Showtime on Sunday nights. Mark McKinnon, thanks for coming on the show, and uh, don't get too exhausted on the campaign trail there. Oh, no. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me on. Kick it hard and carry on regardless. Thanks again to Mark McKinnon for coming on the podcast today. You can catch his show, The Circus, inside the greatest political show on Earth, every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern on Showtime. And you can read his weekly column at thedailybeast.com. Also, if you'd like to support his efforts to reform money and politics, he's the founder of an organization called Mayday Pack. And you can find out more at mayday.us. That's M-A-Y-D-A-Y dot U-S. Don't forget to subscribe to Kick-Ass Politics on iTunes. And while you're there, leave us a review. 
I'd also appreciate it if you went to our site and filled out a brief audience survey. And please recommend Kick-Ass Politics to your friends on social media. And if you really want to help out, then donate to our GoFundMe campaign at gofundme.com backslash kickasspolitics. Follow us on Twitter at KA Politics or visit Kickass Politics on Facebook. And as always, I welcome your comments, questions, and suggestions at comments at kickasspolitics.com. In the next episode, I'll talk with the iconic photographer, Platon. If you've seen a political big shot on the cover of a magazine, chances are you're looking at his work. His portraits have graced the covers of Time Magazine, Esquire, The New Yorker, Rolling Stone, and Vanity Fair, just to name a few. He's become a legend as the go-to photographer of the most powerful world leaders, including every living U.S. president and the most famous and infamous heads of state, from Tony Blair and Benjamin Netanyahu to Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and Gaddafi. He'll come on the show to discuss his secrets to getting the most powerful people in the world to let their guard down. Plus, he'll reveal how he got Vladimir Putin to sit for the only portrait of his entire life for Time's Man of the Year cover. And we'll talk about his now infamous Esquire photo of Bill Clinton. He'll also talk about his new project that's putting a face on the cause of human rights around the world. Coming up in the next episode. But for now, I'm Ben Mathis, and thanks for listening to Kick-Ass Politics. This podcast may not be reproduced without express written permission. Kick-Ass Politics is a trademark of Mathis Entertainment, Inc.